Hey, welcome back. What is it about this kettlebell that has anything to do with my shooting? Well, let's talk about it. You're probably wondering, what is Keith talking about today? Well, my first year in PRS introduced me to a lot of new things, and one of the new things that it introduced me to was muzzle brakes. Muzzle brakes are these wonderful devices that have magical properties eliminating the recoil from our rifles, right? Well, not exactly. And there's many considerations in the design of a muzzle brake that affect your outcomes, some of which I've learned the hard way in the last year. So today I'm going to give you an overview of what features to look for in your first muzzle brake or in a subsequent muzzle brake if you're fighting problems with yours. So guys, let's get started with a very simple subject. Okay, it's not simple. How do muzzle brakes work? So you're probably wondering, what is this for? Well, it's to explain Newton's third law. And that is for each action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Right now, at the moment, this kettlebell is pressing down into my hand with 10 pounds of force. Well, unsurprisingly, my hand is pressing up with 10 pounds of force. Otherwise, it would fall to the floor. So we have to understand that for each action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. How does that apply to what we're talking about? Well, when we're going to accelerate a bullet down a barrel, guess what? something has to resist the force of the mass of the bullet being accelerated. And that's the mass of the rifle. But that mass, well, it gets accelerated as well, just at a lower rate than what the bullet is because it weighs so much more. Well, if that's what recoil is, how does a muzzle brake work? That's not the entirety of recoil. Recoil has two basic components. The first is the acceleration of the mass of the bullet down the barrel. The second is the subsequent gas effect as the muzzle gases, as that high pressure gas expands right at the muzzle of the rifle. That's why you see certain powders make different recoil impulses than others. It's the rate of acceleration of the bullet down the barrel and the amount of gas emitted at the muzzle. Lower muzzle pressures result in lower recoil overall values, but for the same velocity, the recoil is going to feel sharper. Yeah, it makes no sense when you think about it until you really think about it. So how does a muzzle brake equate into this? Well, the simple thing about a muzzle brake is it is nothing more than a gas redirector. Its job is to catch those gases coming out of the muzzle and redirect them sideways and rearward to take advantage of that gas, to redirect that explosive flow to the rear, to act as a shock absorber. And it does act as a shock absorber. If you are firing the rifle hard held, you're going to get all of the recoil of accelerating the mass of the bullet before the muzzle brake has a chance to take effect. So that recoil impulse from accelerating the bullet is only going to move your rifle somewhere between 50 thousandths and maybe 150 thousandths. After that, the gas effect takes over and it acts like a rocket motor pressing that rifle back into you, unless you have a muzzle brake, in which case it's decelerating the rifle from its already existing velocity to limit the felt recoil of the rifle. So it's a very simple system and a simple device that takes a lot of engineering to get right. And today I want to talk to you about some of the things I've learned about muzzle brakes, some things to look for and some things to avoid in your search for just that right muzzle brake so that you get the best benefit for your rifle. So let me start with my first piece of advice having to do with muzzle brakes. And that is very simply, don't use a muzzle brake if you don't need one. They add complexity to your system and add an opportunity to reduce your precision and create problems for you. If you don't need to thread the muzzle for a muzzle brake, don't. If you don't need a muzzle brake that's creating aerodynamic factors against the bullet as it's passing through the baffles, don't. It's just noise in your system. Now, I'm not saying that a muzzle brake rifle can't shoot accurately. Far from it. It is very possible to do and is relatively simple in concept. But I have seen more times than not someone screw a muzzle brake on and have immediate problems, including myself. Because muzzle brake design is, well, some art and some science. And a lot of muzzle brake manufacturers are doing the art side of the equation and none of the science. But I'm not here to tear down manufacturers or tell you buy this one, not that one. Because as you know, product reviews really aren't my thing. Now, for this particular video, I'm going to disclose that I was given two muzzle brakes by Precision Armament. These hypertap muzzle brakes are my favorite 
and I received them for no cost to me. This was not an exchange for a video and it was not an exchange for a review. So just be aware that I have a little bias that is resultant from receiving something for free. The other muzzle brakes that I used for this study were purchased by me at retail prices. So my favorite muzzle brake really doesn't matter because eliminating your own personal bias is very hard to do. At the same time, I'll let you know that I do shoot with the HyperTap muzzle brake when I can screw any one of the others on. I still use the HyperTap. So it can't be a bad brake. But is it the best? Well, let's take a look at some semi quasi scientific analysis of how the rifle behaves because that's what's most important to me. But before we get into that, let's talk about precision first because muzzle brakes can both positively and negatively affect your precision. I bet you didn't know that. You thought they just slowed the rifle down, right? If you study muzzle brake design for any amount of time, you're going to find out that flat brakes, what are basically a flat baffle, a wall to stop the gas, was one of the original design parameters. The idea is by stopping the expanding gases from going forward, you eliminate that jet thrust, that rocket thrust from the muzzle. And that is an effective way to reduce the overall recoil. However, after a few generations of design, it became very apparent that you could redirect that thrust rearward, at least in an angle, to help reduce that recoil a little more, or more so to decelerate the already accelerated rifle some, or decelerate it more quickly thus reducing the felt recoil. So let's get into the features that I look for in a muzzle brake today, because today's field of muzzle brakes is immense. I'm not gonna go out there and buy every single one of them and try them out and compare them for recoil reduction or precision or anything else, because honestly, I don't have the budget to do that. And neither do you. So let's talk about features that signal a potential good outcome for you when you buy that muzzle brake. And number one on the list is a flat baffle design. Flat baffle designs generally, not always, but generally are more precision oriented. In other words, you're gonna get better precision out of the rifle with less effort with a flat baffle design. Now, does that mean flat all the way out to the sides? No, it can be cranked back at the edges. As a matter of fact, the flat doesn't have to be very large at all. Take, for example, this HyperTap brake. It has a very small flat in it but that flat is enough to keep the precision up. Now, I've told you that I've done some testing. I have a muzzle brake in my possession that I will not show you because I don't want to speak poorly of the manufacturer that, well, it negatively impacts my precision, especially with long boat tailed bullets. Flat baffle design, in my experience, is more precision oriented. You're gonna get better precision out of the rifle easier with a flat baffle, but that's not the only thing that matters. So let's move into a little more science stuff and talk about how the nozzles are designed because that's critical as well. If you work at all with supersonic aerodynamics, this is not going to be new to you. Just skip ahead to the next section. But ultimately, when we are designing a nozzle for the gills on a muzzle brake, that nozzle, well, it can be very efficient or it can be very inefficient. Let me give you an idea of one methodology that works very well, and that is a convergent divergent nozzle. What's a convergent divergent nozzle, you ask? Well, if you look at a fighter jet, when it goes into afterburner, you'll notice that the turkey feathers at the back end of the engine open up wide. If you look at the nozzle on a rocket, it has a bell shape to it. Well, before the bell shape, it is constricted some. The whole idea of a convergent divergent nozzle is to accelerate an already supersonic stream even faster. Well, guess what? The stream coming out the muzzle of your rifle is supersonic. That's why it makes that big banging noise. And ultimately, taking that already supersonic gas and accelerating more when facing it rearward is going to increase the efficiency of the muzzle brake in the recoil, well, modulation process. I don't want to call it recoil reduction. It's actually acting as a gas shock absorber. It makes it absorb more shock and slow the rifle faster which can be beneficial to keeping you on target or can reduce the recoil into your shoulder to keep your position a little, well, cleaner. Okay. But that flat plane and the design of the nozzles headed rearward are not the only things to consider. Muzzle brakes can have ports or even angled gills that create downforce when you fire your rifle. But what does that actually do? Well, let's take a look at a comparison between this Kahuna brake and the HyperTap brake. The HyperTap has not been drilled for any vertical gas at all, 
so it's a straight back muzzle brake, as recommended by Matt at Precision Armament. Now, the Kahuna brake has angled gills, so it creates some downforce. And while the downforce, when fired from the bipod, does reduce the muzzle rise some, it has another effect, and I'm going to show you that right now. This is a 26 inch long, inch and a quarter diameter barrel, shot at 100 yards. You see that post shot bounce? That's the reaction of the stock to the forces slamming downward on the muzzle of the rifle. It oscillates a little bit. Now, with this particular configuration, with this short, thick, stiff barrel, it's not too bad. But when I go to a 28 inch M24 profile barrel, this is a 600 yard shot here. That Kahuna brake, it oscillates quite a bit more to the point where you can't actually see the bullet impact. That could be a negative connotation. So my advice with vertical gas dispersal out of the ports of a muzzle brake is to be very careful with it because it can create deleterious effects that negatively affect your ability to read your downrange feedback from your shot. Now, this is very situational. It depends on barrel profile and length. It depends on the stiffness of your stock. It depends on your bipod placement or whether you're shooting off of a bipod or a bag because it's nowhere near as dramatic when you're shooting off of a bag that's pressed up against the magazine well. In other words, you're going to have to choose the lesser of two evils, muzzle rise or bounce, and determine which one is better for you. I'm not going to give you any advice there because I'm still experimenting trying to figure out which one I like better. There's one other thing that I found is really critical to success with a muzzle brake, and that is, you got it, alignment. Having perfect alignment of the bore to the hole all the way through the muzzle brake is critical. Now, the vast majority of muzzle brakes are threaded on. And threads, well, no matter how well you machine them, they have slight tolerances to them. And even the best muzzle brake designs have to flange up against something. If you don't have a good square flange to a good square flange to keep that muzzle brake aligned, you're going to have slight misalignments. Self-timing muzzle brakes are notorious for not being perfectly aligned. They can be out just a little bit, or they can be out a lot, and it can cause some really interesting effects on the grouping of your rifle and the point of impact. As a matter of fact, if you have a self-timing brake, I'm going to advise you to do one of two things. One is don't take it off unless you have a chance to recite in your rifle afterward and check your tune. Or two is take that self-timing nut and put some Loctite on that sucker. Turn it into a one-piece brake that is fitted to your barrel. Use a Loctite that you can release with some heat so that you can take it off and put it on the next barrel. But ultimately, you want that thing to be a rock that you just screw on and snug up with a wrench and don't have to touch again. And you certainly don't have to reset the timing each time you do it. Because every time you reset the timing, you are going to create slight differentials in the timing and of the alignment of the muzzle brake. Which brings me to the next subject. If you don't have perfect alignment, what about the size of the hole through the muzzle brake? Well, many YouTubers have done tests already to look at what kind of efficiency you get out of a muzzle brake in the recoil reduction space based on the size of the hole through the muzzle brake. And what they found was the reduction in recoil from a, an ever smaller hole was not that much. You could go with a brake that was a caliber upsized and not see any real deficit in the recoil reduction properties of the brake. This is important because this is going to be my next piece of advice. Upsize your brake. Now, this is not each and every brake. For example, the HyperTap brake has a through hole through it for the 6mm that is the size of a 6.5. It's already upsized. So, talk to your manufacturer, figure out what size of hole they're using, because having too little clearance around the bullet as it passes through the muzzle brake can create all kinds of deleterious effects. And that's even if you've locked the muzzle brake timing nut down on it with Loctite. You have to be really careful about the size of the hole through the muzzle brake. For me, if I was going to buy one for a 6mm, it would be 6.5. If I'm building a 6.5, I'm going to use a 7mm or a 30 cal brake. If I'm doing 7mm, I'm obviously going 30 cal. And if I'm doing a 30 cal, I'm going to use a 338 brake. Now, that makes no sense to certain people who are thinking only about recoil reduction, but I'm thinking about precision here. If it reduces the recoil just a little bit less, but I get better precision on the rifle, better groupings, and better accuracy, I'm going to hit the target with the first shot, and I really don't need to reduce the recoil anywhere near as much. Now, I'm sure that a lot of you are out there ha that have tuner muzzle brakes or muzzle brakes with tuners behind them or any variety of variation there is. But I have a question for you. What happens to a muzzle brake as you shoot it? 
Does carbon build up in the break? Maybe a little bit of copper too. Of course it does. So as you shoot the brake more and more and more, it's going to build up a larger and larger and larger mass of material inside the brake. Doesn't that change your tune? Of course it does. As a matter of fact, it changes not just your tune, but your point of impact. Here's the big thing that you need to do if you're going to shoot a muzzle brake for competition or high volume shooting, and that is clean your muzzle brake. Remember I said that you should lock tight the nut onto your muzzle brake? Well, that makes it easier to take the muzzle brake off, put it in the cleaner, get it all clean and put it back on the rifle without losing your timing or suffering the consequences of having to retime that muzzle brake, losing both your tune and your alignment. So guys, in the end, muzzle brakes are something that, well, you may need in order to mitigate the recoil enough that you can shoot the rifle. If you don't need it, don't put one on there. It really isn't that important to have. It's not a must have. It's a nice to have. For my 223 training rifle, I am running a muzzle brake on it, as silly as it seems, mostly so I get used to the noise and concussion of using a muzzle brake instead of needing to reduce the recoil of this little pop gun. All right, guys, that's what I have for muzzle brakes. One, don't use them unless you need to. Two, self-timing brakes have some limitations built into them that can be fixed by doing a gunsmith installed brake, by the way. Three, use a flat baffle anytime you can because it's going to be more precision oriented. Four, use a bigger hole through the muzzle brake than is absolutely necessary. And five, be careful about vertical discharge of gas because it can set up a vibration or an oscillation in your rifle that is counterproductive for seeing what's going on downrange. All right, guys, until next time, shoot straight. Really consider what equipment you actually need in order to accomplish the mission at hand. And I'll see you in the next video.